Greetings, unsettled souls. Uh, Sam I, B. DeGangie, doing political commentary for The Media Speaks. Yes, there is a delay between the two cameras, and uh, that's why. Because one of them, right there, you are low def, and uh, you're live. And you guys, you're high def. So if you're not watching this live, you might as well go and watch uh, watch both of them. See which one you like better. Guys, I'm in sort of a silly mood today. Uh, again, a, a lot of the news I get to is not silly and happy. But um, I always want to start the show off in such a way. And it's not often that I go ahead and reintroduce people to the show. I do it every once in a while. Friends, this is a political commentary show. I'm not a reporter. I'm not. Reintroduction to the show. If you've already seen it, skip ahead. This won't go on more than three minutes. This is not a reporter. I'm a political commentator. You got long hair and you look gothic and satanic. You're right about everything except the Satanism. I'm in a band. I'm in passing time. We're opening for Pop Will Eat Itself at the Cleveland Agora. And uh, if you don't know, they're one of the bands that Nine Inch Nails signed right when Trent blew up. They signed Manson and they signed Pop Will Eat Itself. And we are going to get to open for Pop Will Eat Itself. Yes, I'm in a band. Yes, I have tattoos. Guess what? I also have a degree. I'm not going to go bragging about what I have. But for those of you that think I have no qualifications at all, I have a degree. I'm also very good at doing things like reading. That's it. And then I comment on what I read on. I'm not going to be twirling on my head. This is the camera angle that you're getting. If I were you, I wouldn't watch. It's probably not that interesting. What, what do you do? Do you, do, you, do you play video games? Do you, do you sweep? I don't care what you're doing. Just listen. Okay? How's that? Just listen. It's the correct views. I do political commentary, and I do it on things that matter in ways that I think matter, and that'll reach the average person. If you like the video, great. If you don't, you hate the video, then go make better videos. I don't care. The point is, there aren't enough of us out here doing something, and we are. So, uh, welcome to the correct views. We got the behind-the-scenes queen, Christelle, in the back, and uh, you... They always say you never see Christelle. Look, of course you're going to see Christelle. Um, Reason.com, U.S. sentences are vastly, shockingly longer than just about anywhere else. I, I didn't mean you were going to see her now. Uh, between 1980 and 2013... Do you want to see me now? I, that's what I thought, yeah. Between 1980 and... Hi. Oh, see that? You just saw her. Between 1980 and 2013, the federal prison population exploded. All right, guys, no more joking around. Let's get into the grim reality that is what we do. Uh, from 24,640, listen to this, to 219,298. Do you understand that? Okay. Do you understand that from 1980 to 2013, we went from 24,640 prisoners to almost 220, if you're rounding down, 219,000 people. Do you mean to tell me that we have 219,298 people that need to be locked up? Now, I'm not talking about the rapists and the child molesting. If you have an ounce of common sense, you know who I'm not talking about, okay? Do you mean to tell me then that we have 219,000 murderers, child molesters, kidnappers, rapists? Now, my ass we do. We are locking up people for any and everything in this country. And it's really bad. Do you realize we lock up more people than China? Not only are we supposed to be more free than China, China has more people than we do. Now, again, I'm not going to compare the condition of the prisons, but do you understand we lock up more people than China is my point here? I'm not saying you're better off in a Chinese prison. I have to say things like that or I get these ridiculous comments. You think it's better in a Chinese prison? No, that kind of wasn't the point. It says the National Association of Assistant U.S. Attorneys insists in a recent position paper that our federal prison population is not exploding. How so? 
The number of federal prisons fell slightly between 2013 and 2014 from uh, 219,298 to 214,149. I don't feel much better about that. Is it just me? It says the desperation reflected in such transparently misleading arguments is a hopeful sign for those of us who agree with former Attorney General Eric Holder that too many Americans go to too many prisons for far too long and for no truly good law enforcement reason. Now, Eric Holder was not by any stretch of the imagination a great Attorney General, but he has a point here. Bipartisan support for sentencing reform is stronger than at any point in recent memory. With the Obama administration and leading Republicans in both chambers of Congress united in viewing current penalties as excessively harsh. I've long believed that there needs to be reform of the criminal justice system. Speaker of House John Boehner, again, not exactly the fountain of wisdom by any stretch of the imagination. He says, we've got a lot of people in prison, frankly, who, in my view, really don't need to be there. And why is this happening? For one thing, there are contracts with private prisons. They promise to keep so many people in jail for such and such a contract, a deal. Does that seem like that's anywhere anchored even close to anything that you have ever heard in the Constitution. Now, I know a lot of a lot of Hillary supporters hate me, and if you happen to be a Hillary supporter, even you and I right now are agreeing because we have people locked up for things like pot. And Victimless crimes, and don't tell me there isn't a victimless crime. The only people that believe that are people that think that somehow America should be locking up more people than China. It says most Americans seem to agree, according to the ACLU survey. Well, I would imagine so. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure that out. What we're doing is making it so that America, as it says here, and there's links for it, the highest incarceration rate. And it reflects that dubious distinction in a recent Georgetown Law Review that the U.S. locks up more people than anyone. We are committed to a system of harsh sentencing because we believe that long sentences deter crime. Sounds like clockwork orange. And in any event, incapacitate criminals from victimizing the general population while they are in prison. And indeed, the United States is enjoying an all-time low in violent crime rates, which would seem to support this in intuition. But crime rates have been dropping steadily since the 90s, and not merely in the U.S., but throughout the industrialized world. Our intuition about harsh sentences deterring crime may be thus misguided. We may be spending scarce tax dollars taxpayer dollars, maintaining the largest prison population in the industrialized world, not just the free world, the industrialized world, shattering countless lives and families for no good reason. And I guarantee everybody listening to my voice right now, whether you like me or don't like me, it doesn't really matter. Right now, you know somebody whose life got hosed for doing something that did not deserve being put into prison for. Well, friends, that's why I do this show. Because if more people are out crying about this, then you'll find that these things kind of stop. How many of you heard that Food Babe managed to make sure now that Starbucks has pulled their artificial coloring out of the caramel flavoring that makes the pumpkin spice cappuccino? Well. We're going to do this for cappuccino, and God bless her, but we're not going to do it for something that matters like this? That's, that's insane. We're locking up people for nothing. Listen to this. It is well established that drug trafficking is inherently violent. The NAA USA declares it would be more accurate to say violence is a predictable feature on the black market, which is what you make when you make it illegal, 
created by the prohibition policy, which did not work in the days of Al Capone. That's why you know Al Capone's name. That the NA. A USA avidly supports. Leaving that point aside, uh, it is saying that it does not matter if the particular defendant a judge happens to be sentencing has never been hurt by a fly. He must pay for the crimes of others in his line of work. In other words, if you traffic drugs and you hurt absolutely nobody, you get the same penalty as somebody that trafficked drugs and shot somebody on the way across the border. Why are we supporting these things? And there's more and more and more in this. Um, I, I liked this, this paragraph, and it's, I promise I'll go on to the next story after this. Just listen. And then go, because you're going to want to hear, uh, read the rest for yourself at Reason.com. The NAA USA tries to redefine violence, arguing that all drug dealing is dangerous, taking the lives of thousands of Americans, destroying families, and undermining, undermining the moral fabric of our communities. Regardless of whether any individual offender engages in an act of violence during the commission of a drug offense. In other words... If I sell you heroin and you die after injecting too much of it at once or, more likely, recklessly consuming it with other depressants, I may as well have murdered you. Likewise, presumably, if I sell you a bottle of whiskey and you die of acute alcohol poisoning after consuming it all in one sitting or from injuries sustained in a drunken driving crash, in other words, the drug prohibition doesn't make any more sense than anything else. Yeah, if you got some bonehead selling a crack cocaine on the playground where your kid plays, it might be a good idea to arrest him. However, if somebody is stupid enough to use this drug in, a, in their own home and they're not bothering anybody, I think it's a boneheaded move to do. You're going to be losing your teeth, your health, your heart, and in some instances, your mind. But it's, you don't need to be in prison. I don't need to be going to work every day to keep you in prison. Well, what if the crackhead harms somebody? Didn't we say at the beginning of this that if you're harming somebody, we're in favor of you going to prison. That's the correct views. Welcome aboard. Guys, this is really interesting, and I wanted to get to it for everyone. It's uh, Infowars has it posted as well, and they've been posting a lot of this stuff lately. It's actually from RT, uh, Russia Today. Three, uh, well, let me get to the uh, headline. Cops claim privacy violation, and they sue over a video showing them eating marijuana <laughs> during a raid. What happened is they went in to a legal marijuana dispenser. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if it's voted in by the states, the states trump the feds. The feds don't trump the state. That is a turnaround that should not be. Has never been in American history, but somehow has been allowed to happen now. The cops go in and they're eating the weed to get a high from it. <laughs> they are mad that they were filmed. And yet, what do cops do? Film you for everything. This is the world we live in. This is the Fourth Amendment. This almost got a dumb D of the day, but it was so important. I didn't want to tack it at the end because so many people have such short attention spans. They don't make it. Three Santa Ana, California officers who are absolute boneheads are suing their own department after video footage that allegedly shows them eating marijuana edibles during a raid has emerged. The officers who were suspended argued that the video violated their privacy, as they violate the rights of people just by participating in the raid, no less. The officers were part of a team that raided an illegal marijuana dispensary, it says. The Sky High Collective on May 26th in Orange County, California. The land of Jerry Brown, who the dead Kennedys were right about. Terrible. Filed in Orange County Superior Court by three unidentified police officers and their union, the lawsuit seeks to prevent the department's internal affairs investigators from using the video 
as they sort out what happened during the May raid. Well, the next time the police catch you doing something illegal in a public place on camera, then why don't you tell them the same argument? I'm sure that'll go over just great. The lawyer for the dispensary, Matthew Pappas, provided the Orange County Register and Santa Ana Police with two versions of the raid footage, a highlight reel with subtitles, and what he said are unedited video clips. Pappas said the lawsuit was ironic as police routinely use surveillance camera against video suspects. It's pretty pathetic, it goes on, for police to say if we don't like something that it can't be used as evidence, Pappas told the Orange County Register. They knew they were on video. Just because they missed one camera does not make it illegal. And it isn't. The lawsuit argues that the video doesn't paint a fair version of offense and claims the footage shouldn't be used as evidence because, among other things, the police didn't know they were on camera. So that makes it not fair that they were eating the marijuana that everybody should be allowed to eat if they so please, according to the voters of California. See, this is the world we live in, where they, they get special treatment because they're doing some great thing. All they're doing is trampling and destroying your rights, friends. Absolutely ridiculous. I hope they get the same penalty that the average person who was in that dispensary is going to get. How's that? Another correct view. More along the lines of the insanity that we have here, new drunk driving legislation could require breathalyzers in all new cars. Now, friends, and I've made no bones about it. I have very, very few things on my record, but I've never lied about this. I got a DUI when I was perfectly sober. I'm a DJ for a living. And I made the mistake once when we were still allowed to consume at work, and I had a last call shot. Now, I hadn't drank anything in like three or four hours, nothing. I don't know if the bartender free poured it, I have no idea. But when I got pulled over, point eight is legal. I blew barely over it. The cop made a joke and said, oh, I could almost let you go, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Why? Because it's a money racket. You don't nail somebody that is perfectly sober and you can't even tell they're drunk so you make them blow into something so that you can maybe catch them at something and again i've talked about the woman that was held down and uh, attacked with needles and forced to give blood once it's one of my highest viewed videos look up correct views needles police abuse um it's about getting you into the system, getting you into the court, getting you to pay for the DUI, getting you to pay for the classes, the yada, yada, yada. If someone isn't ripped, they shouldn't even be getting a DUI. And someone says, well, do you know that, do you know here that uh, it, it, so many accidents, someone's had a drink or two and it's proven that it was a factor? Do you know they would have had the same accident at the same time under the same circumstances if they hadn't been drinking? that it was just an accident that they would have had alcohol or not. But no, they want to sell you their courts and their DUIs, and they want to rope some people into classes that they can't get out of. It's all about money. It's not a, about safety. Well, now they're looking to sell you something else. New drunk driving legislation could require breath of lie. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. What you do is you, you wait in front of a bar and you wait for the person to get into the car and then you pull them over for anything at all, any and everything at all, breathalyze them and pray that you get, it's like fishing. It, that's all it is. That no weaving, no swerving, no signs of anything at all. Just sit in front of the bar and nail the person. This is from a Bold Ride. Zach Doral wrote an excellent, it's a little tiny piece here, but it, it, the amount of truth that's in three paragraphs is mind-blowing, so stay with me. Each year, thousands of lives are lost as a result of drunk driving-related car accidents. It's a heart-wrenching statistic and even more painful considering that drunk driving is preventable. However, the New York Condrithman Kathleen Rice is working to further drunk driving prevention and announced on July 14th that she will introduce legislation that could mandate U.S. automakers to equip all cars 
with alcohol breath testing units. Now you, Mr. Mrs. Well, they, they wouldn't have gotten pulled over if they hadn't done something. I drink, and I've never gotten pulled over. That's because I'm not doing anything wrong when I drink. Well, you're going to have to prove it. Just like you thought was fair for everyone else. I told you, I told you, I told you, I told you they're going to make it everyone. And no one would listen. This is like the, Sam is so unbelievably right that it cannot even be debated kind of right. This is another one where it doesn't matter. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. It does not matter. The writing is on the wall. These breathalyzers, known as ignition interlock devices, monitor a driver's blood alcohol content and will prevent the car's engine from starting if the level surpasses a predetermined or legal limit. <laughs> this, is, this is where this kind of thing always leads. Always, always, always. You deliberately bring the amount of alcohol down to a ridiculously low level where nobody even that weighs over a hundred pounds is drunk you then find that person and more importantly make them a drunk driving statistic and then you can ramp up the hype using sober people in your drunk driving statistics and then when your drunk driving statistics are quite high, then you can sell something like this as reasonable. Welcome to America. Advancing the progress we've made combating drunk driving demands bold action, said Rice in a press statement. That's why I'm working on legislation to require ignition interlock devices in all new cars. This technology saves lives, it saves money, and I'm going to fight to make it a standard equipment in American cars. In other words, how do you get more money out of people for doing absolutely nothing wrong and being a threat to no one? Guys, um, I, enough of that, the, the legislative abuse for just a second. I, I found this more than interesting. I wanted to get to it. Just real quick, The Verge. And if you want more political stuff, trust me, it's coming. A new NASA-funded study lays out a plan to return humans to the moon. This, again, we need a. Can we go in some direction that doesn't involve ISIS killing somebody, politics, or police abusing? Yes, we can. I would like to see more study along these lines. I know there's people saying we'll never again go to the moon because we were warned by the moon people to not return. Well, I don't believe it, but we'll know for a minute if it's true, won't we? Humans could return to the moon in the next decade and live there a decade after a new study claims and there's a link to it. The announcement, it says, was made on the 46th anniversary of the Apollo 11 crew's first steps on the lunar surface. The study performed by Next Gen, Next Gen, excuse me, Space LLC, and partly funded by NASA, concludes that the space agency could land humans on the moon in the next five to seven years, build a permanent base 10 to 12 years after that, and do it all within the existing budget for human spacecraft. And of course, we know, a space flight. And of course, we know that's very important to those funding it. The way for NASA to do this is to adapt the same practice as it's using for resupplying the International Space Station and will eventually use for crew transport. Public-private partnership with companies like SpaceX, Orbital ATK, and the United Launch Alliance. Um, uh, it says uh, the, the cost then is uh, brought down by a factor of 10 for those of you mathematically inclined. So good, you know I mean? It's good to see. The price, it says, have come down from $46,000 a kilogram. Uh, uh, used to be uh, the space shuttle, $60,000 a kilogram. Uh, now they can do it for $4,750 per kilogram. So it's coming down. It doesn't sound like anybody uh, that's less rich than Justin Timberlake is going to be doing it anytime soon. Anybody see that story but me? Uh, nobody. But... Uh, it, Again, they're trying to do it, and I'm happy about it. 
Friends, I want to get to this. I got a few stories left. This, I got into an argument with this well-meaning bonehead on InfoWars. This has to be the dumbest thing I've ever seen since the uh, DUI facade that I gave you a minute ago. Independent.co.uk Study finds that violent video games may be linked to aggressive behavior. This is ridiculous. Let me tell you why. How many studies, for one, have you all seen that said people that play video games tend to be less good at social skills, they're fatter, they're lazier, they're less ambitious, they just sit around their house and eat Doritos and you wipe the orange all over their shirt, uh, you know, they grow fuzzy beards and don't bathe. Okay. Study finds that violent video games may be linked to aggressive behavior. This doesn't make any sense. What, are they lazy couch potatoes or are they beating their girlfriends? This is ridiculous. And let me tell you what this is. How many of you know the difference between associative and causative? I'll explain it this way. Because people do this all the time. It is 4.32 in the morning where I'm at. 8.18, 20.15. It's dark outside. You know, every time that I do a show at this time, it's dark. And this show is caused by darkness. <laughs> no, no, no. Causative is, I turned the camera on and with effort did this show and it happened to be dark. That's what's happening here. Uh, how many people have you have heard that uh, LSD causes schizophrenia? That's not true at all. What happens is people that have a history of schizophrenia will oftentimes have a terrible reaction to LSD and they will never be okay again. It will trigger a psychosis that otherwise might not have shown up. That is the one danger with LSD. Um, it was not caused by the LSD. That's what we're seeing here in the video games. A combination of the LSD effect that I gave you and the, uh, the nighttime makes the Sam talk <laughs> scenario. Video games do not cause anything. And again, I, I'm, I, I remember growing up, oh my God, I listened to Ozzy. I was going to worship the devil. It never happened. I watch horror movies, so I'm going to want to watch snuff movies. Never happened. Um... If you have parenting with even the most minimal skill, at some point they teach you that Gene Simmons really isn't a demon. It's just his makeup. It's fake blood. And you know what? You don't grow up and become an axe murderer. That's why fans of hip-hop, no matter which color they are, we're not going there, fans of hip-hop, oftentimes have uh, a very hard time distinguishing fact from fiction because a lot of the people in the community tend to live that lifestyle. And you'll see it in uh, extreme forms of heavy metal. Am I a fan? I am a huge fan of extreme forms of heavy metal. However, if you have very bad parenting, again, no matter what color you are, if someone doesn't tell you at some point that Slayer is fiction, this could be a very bad day. That does not mean that Slayer causes murder. It means that the inability to differentiate fact from fiction or to be able to subscribe to what is called suspension of disbelief, choosing to know that something is fake, that inability is what does it. And it has nothing to do with the video games. Any more than the fact that it's dark outside has anything to do with the fact that I'm speaking into a camera. Two cameras, as it were. Um, psychologists have confirmed that playing violent video games is linked to aggressive and callous behavior. A review of almost a decade of studies found that exposure to video games was a risk factor for increased aggression. Yeah, just like LSD is a risk factor for schizophrenia, but only if you're already headed in that direction. It's common sense. This study makes no sense at all. It's backed by absolute quackery. 
It says the same team of experts said that there was insufficient evidence to conclude that the influence of games such as Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto led to criminal acts. If your kid thinks that Grand Theft Auto is real and starts telling you how cool it would be to steal cars, maybe you should tell him it's fiction. And I bet you this whole study goes poof in the air. Just the tiniest bit. And again, they list Doom 3. Doom. You're killing Martians. It desensitizes you. As far as we know, there are no big pink Martians. Killing the Martians has very little to do with wanting to go and kill people. I'm sorry. This is the most boneheaded thing I've ever seen. It says the APA has urged game creators to increase levels of parental control over the violence in the video games. You know, I think the Mar Super Mario Brothers led to people kicking and killing turtles. Boneheadedness. Friends, you're listening to The Correct View. Sam I.B. DeGangie doing political commentary for the media speaks. Got two more stories to get to, including the dumdy of the day. Don't go anywhere at all, because the dumdy of the day is once again uh, tied to our leaders. I want to give a shout out real quick to Sticker Junkie. These are passing time stickers. If you want one, they're a dollar. Go to the correct views at hotmail.com. You know where they were made from? They were made by Sticker Junkie, who did an absolutely amazing job making them. And if you would like your stickers, your logo, maybe you want to help out Rand Paul. Maybe you want to help out Donald Trump. Maybe you think they all suck and you want to run. Well, you can get your stickers made for your election at StickerJunkie.com. And as good as they look, hell, you might even win. Uh, friends, this is brought to you by Mike McLaughlin here. It's another independent.co.uk story. Uh, Mike McLaughlin, M-A-C-L-E-U-G-H-L-I-N. And look him up on Facebook.com. Some of the best political rants, poetry, and short stories written today are written by him. This, friends, I can painfully tell you is true. Constantly checking your mobile phone can lead to cognitive failures. This is funny, and I'm glad it's dated because Christelle would think that I was doing this just because of our conversation. But no, that couldn't be because this wasn't written yet. My girlfriend, my wife cannot go one hour without checking her phone. And I don't mean if it rings, because usually if the phone rings, it is somebody may be calling for an emergency. Um, nobody texts an emergency. It doesn't happen. You don't, I'm bleeding to death. I, I think I'm having a stroke and I want to say goodbye. So I'm going to text. That doesn't happen. That does not happen. Um, can't. I mean, if it goes off, cannot, cannot do it. Can't. And incapable of doing it. This can lead to a worsening of other conditions that can be addictive. And it's interesting because she has not been able to quit smoking in four and a half years. And they're tied together. And I, 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 I'm, I'm not calling her out because I have trouble not ticking on my Facebook when I'm watching something. And if it bloops more than once, I shut Facebook off until the end of the movie. Off. Won't even look at it. It is off. I already don't have it tied to my phone. That would make me kill myself. Um, if you do that, you're insane. Blue, blue, blue. You lose your mind. But, um... At least I would. My point being, this this is everywhere. And, and if you don't pull yourself away from it, then this will happen. This is why I'm commenting on it before we get to the dumb the other day. Whether sitting on a train or having dinner at a restaurant, many people find it hard to stop fiddling with their mobile phones, firing off a never-ending stream of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter posts. I'll tell you another person that does this is our band singer, Serenity. If the band is like just chilling after practice and everybody's, you know, maybe we're doing a shot because, you know, again, we don't do them while we're playing. We, 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 we are business first. Maybe we're sitting down and we're all chilling and uh, Serenity is famous for not liking to do shots. So 
we're all be sitting there and on the phone. And I ask, I practice once. I said, does anybody remember having any conversations with the band singer after practice ever? No, not one. Not one person in the room, in the band, including a couple friends of the band. And no, I cannot off the phone. And I see it everywhere I go. It's insane. I see it at concerts. And I'm not talking about nerds like me that film the show. Uh, filming the show does not take away from the show. Because usually you're not looking at your phone when you're filming it. You're just holding it up. I don't have a problem with that. I mean people sending out 20 tweets during the Nine Inch Nails show. What the hell is wrong with you? It says, if this online hyperactivity looks exhausting, it's no surprise to discover that these high-frequency internet users find it much more difficult to pay attention to what's going on around them than the rest of us, even when they are not consumed by the web. And again, that's why I, I admit I have to shut Facebook off, or I will check it. The last time I didn't to plug it again was when I got the Pop Relief Itself show because I had to I had to leave Facebook up to get a hold of the band. Otherwise, no. New research finds that most people frequent mobile phone and internet users are most likely to be distracted, for example, by being prone to missing important appointments and daydreaming while having a conversation. And I, I was guilty of that long before technology, which is why I do shut Facebook off. Again, I... I I, I keep myself away from it because we're all prone to it. That's why I'm commentating on it. In the first study of its kind, an academic from Leicester's de Montfort University, which I'm sure I butchered, butchered the name of, has found that the more times a person uses the internet or their mobile phone, the more likely they are to experience cognitive failures, that is, thinking failures. These include a whole range of blunders and the general lack of awareness of a person's surrounding that stretches as far as people forgetting why they have just gone from one part of the house to the other. Uh, the study draws the same conclusions among users of mobile phones.